Okay. Okay, welcome to everyone. And now I give the word to, to Salvatore. Just a quick introduction. Uh, we know each other since probably four years, three years or something like that. Yeah. Um, we met in a very particular situation because we met at Play 14 the mm -hmm. first time. So we both are, let me say, um, players of Agile games. Let me say this, okay? So we have this passion in common and he is a very smart uh, guy actually. And uh, he, he used to work for the company I'm working now. And I, when we were in touch, uh, I had, uh, I made a lot of pressure to him to introduce me to this company. So there is, this is the kind of relation that we have. Um, he is going to speak about his life and his professional experience. What I can say about uh, Salvatore that uh, is really really open to share their experiences so feel free to make questions during the session because he has a lot of experience with small teams small companies large companies more teams and what else so he has a lot of experience that he can share so don't be shy and make all the questions that you think can be helpful please salvatore Thank you for the introduction, Carrado. And uh, yeah, thank you once again for inviting me back to speak tonight. Uh, we, have, we, we delivered this talk a few months ago in Italian and it was very well received. So we thought we should um, offer it again and this time in English for the uh, Lean Agile Delivering Coaching Network, which I think is a really dynamic uh, community. So thank you, Carrado, for inviting me back. I always appreciate how relevant and how advanced the topics that you guys talk about um, are. And, and thank you for joining us tonight. I appreciate that, uh, you know, probably these days you're all working remotely and uh, you're spending hours on, on Zoom already. So the fact that you're taking um, some extra time to attend my talk, obviously, is very humbling and I'll do my best to uh, deliver, deliver a good one. So speaking about um, games, it's true that I am passionate about play in general and football, uh, among other things. So to, um, to um, structure this talk tonight, I thought we could use a football metaphor. So I'm gonna be using business agility and technical agility as um, almost as if they were two football teams playing against each other, okay? So tonight we'll essentially unpack um, a roadmap of business agility, um, treating technical agility as a key enabler. And to do that, we'll talk about people, we'll talk about product development, we'll talk about process and ways of working, We'll also touch on organizational culture and we'll talk about a technical excellence as well, okay? So if you're ready to go, let's kick off this game. And while I'm telling you a little bit about myself, I'd like you to tell me how many years of experience you have with Agile. And feel free to you know, interpret this question in the, best, uh, in, in the way that uh, fits the best. Um, so it could be years that you've been learning about Agile or it could be years that you have been working um, with Agile teams, okay? So to do this, could you go to menti.com? Uh, you could use both your smartphone or your laptop, any browser from your smartphone or, or, or your laptop will work. And if you go to menti.com and you enter the code that you see on the screen, so 2004069, okay? One more time. 2004 069. Um, while I'm telling you a little bit about myself, I'd like you to tell me how many years of experience you have uh, working with Agile teams. Okay, so what can I tell you about myself? I don't like to talk about myself too much, but as you can see, in the last 10 years, I've worked uh, in a number of organizations. Some of these organizations are fairly popular. You, you can recognize TomTom, Tom, uh, which is the company that makes GPS navigation systems for cars. Um, I've worked for Cognito IQ, which is a workflow automation software company. I've worked for um, Novastone, which, uh, which is a secure messaging platform for finance, especially. I've worked for the Financial Times, which I'm sure you all know is an international newspaper. And then I've worked for a couple of large banks like Lloyd's Banking Group and NatWest. Um, I worked for King, which is um, a gaming company. Um, I'm, I'm sure you all know Candy Crush. Uh, well, King is the company that makes Candy Crush, um, in case you play that on your phone. And right now I'm working with LendingVest. LendingVest is a fintech and, and they work with financial products, um, especially 
um, um, mortgages and, and loans that um, in, you know, direct borrowers or, or even brokers can apply for in case they want to use that money to build properties to, to sell and rent out. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, Salvatore, sorry to interrupt you. Can you repeat the, the code again, please? Absolutely. You can also see it here on the screen. So if you go to menti.com and you enter code 2004069. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, I've been working for a few for a few organizations in a few different industries, especially in recent years, banking and fintech. Um, at the beginning, I was, you know, I used to be a developer, so doing what developers do. I was writing code. Um, then I became a team lead. Um, I became more experienced in actually uh, trying to drive things forward um, for, for my business and my teams. Um, more recently, I uh, have been working as a scrum master. Um, initially, I have to tell you the truth. I did it very badly. Um, I didn't quite understand the, 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 the power and the extent of that role. And once I started to really understand what it meant to be a Scrum Master, I decided I would uh, branch out and learn more about Agile. And in that journey, I also learned about product development, uh, which is something I'm very passionate about. Being an engineer at heart, um, I'm still interested in, in, in what we make as a business and how to create value really for our customers. Um, and more recently, in the last couple of years, I have been working as an Agile coach doing what coaches do. So um, trying to use coaching um, as, a, as a way to enable teams and organizations to really realize their own potential. So asking the right questions, um, helping them develop some skills that I thought could be uh, useful. And as a coach, I really look at teams and the entire system. And I try to work with the leadership team as much as possible to really shape the organization and make agility easier to implement, okay? So that's a little bit about myself. Thank you for taking the survey. Um, I can see that some of you are fairly experienced with Agile. Thank you for, for that uh, kind of feedback. It will help me um, adjust the register you know, in the next few slides. There's a few basic concepts which um, I won't talk too much about because you guys are fairly experienced and uh, you, know, you, know, you, you know the domain and, and this space. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Um, I don't know how it happened in your case, but in my case, uh, typically, um, let's call it an agile transformation starts with technical teams trying to adopt Scrum or Kanban. Um, Scrum or Kanban seem to be the two most popular methodologies these days. Um, so typically, you will see um, someone in acting as a product owner, okay? Um, and around a product owner, you basically build what we know uh, is called a cross-functional team. So this team essentially has all the skills, uh, all the different professional profiles that you need to be able to essentially build um, a product in, in an incremental way uh, for your customer, okay? Now, very soon in the process, this team will uh, realize that in order to do their job well, they need to work with the product owner and agree, for example, on how they're going to um, uh, organize that backlog. Hopefully, they will prioritize that backlog by value, um, whatever value means for your customer. And the product owner is really there to, uh, to help you, um, you know, uh, communicate that vision and help you understand how to best address your customer needs. Now, if you notice on this diagram, which um, is essentially uh, a diagram of the Scrum framework, I have replaced uh, the product increment with a question mark. You can see it there on the slide. And the reason I've done that is because in my experience, it happens very rarely that um, a new agile team will be able to actually produce a product increment um, you know, um, with, with, with a certain consistency just because they have organized themselves in a cross-functional way, okay? So one of the first things that happen very early on in this process is the product owner saying, okay, guys, I know we're working in an agile way. We are adopting Scrum or Kanban. We're doing all the events, but where is the product increment? You know, where, where is something that um, is working and I can start demoing to my customer or at least my stakeholders? The reason why this happens is because um, the new agile team very soon realizes that in order to really implement agility well, they still need best engineering practices. 
And so they need access to a production environment. They need to be able to see um, the changes they make running in production through some monitoring tools. They need to be able to manage their own infrastructure. They need to be comfortable with, uh, uh, with refactoring. And in order to do that, they need to implement practices like automated testing. Testing really at all levels of the software stack, unit, service, and also uh, UI and application logic. When you, when you have a sufficient amount of testing, then you can refactor safely, right? We all know that. After a while, they might realize that uh, with practices such as TDD, test-driven development, and also pair programming, they might be able to accelerate the feedback cycle even further. And these days, with um, uh, all the amazing progress that we've made in recent years in, in the cloud space, um, most Agile teams will also be able to um, um, implement DevOps practices, such as continuous integration, continuous delivery, and also infrastructure as code, using which they will be able to actually write source code that manages, manages the network infrastructure. Um, and so the entire software stack from idea to value is essentially in, in the hands of this team. By using these practices, this team will um, um, learn uh, what we call emergent design practices. This is especially true for architects. Uh, working in an agile way means iterating at all levels, including design. So with these practices in, uh, in their hands, this team will be able to essentially treat architecture in an emergent way. You don't have to figure it all out up front. You don't have to design the entire system um, up front, but you can actually use iterations to understand how to satisfy your customer one iteration at a time. So the design is emergent, okay? So with these new practices, such as Scrum or Kanban, and with this cross-functional structure, together with best engineering practices, hopefully, this team can become both incremental and iterative. And some of the good things that you can see um, such a team do is, for example, they might um, you know, write backlog items that follow the invest principle. Independent, negotiable, valuable, estimable, small and testable. They can write features and user stories that adhere to those criteria. And that helps them really accelerate the feedback cycle. And their lead time and cycle time obviously um, tend to be quite low as a result. This team can also push quality to a very high standard using uh, the best engineering practices that we talked about just a minute ago. Um, typically, we see frequent releases from a team like this. We see refactoring as a habit. And testing really becomes a first class citizen. And as we said, Last not least, design is, is now done in an emergent way. Now, these teams are stable and they are in a continuous learning mode. They are stable because essentially you don't need to break them up. You can keep them there working together, um, leveraging the level of maturity that they've reached. And if you have new features or even new products that you'd like this team to work on, you can simply shift their focus from a previous feature or product to a new one. But essentially, the team is stable. You can keep them there and you can benefit from all the practices that they've been able to adopt in recent times. Okay. Now, um, I have described all these steps, all these evolutionary steps quite quickly. But those of you who work in an agile space will know that these steps are actually quite hard to, um, to reach, to achieve. And for some teams, they, they will actually never get to this level of maturity. But at the same time, I've seen many teams that do. So when the, when the agile um, transformation, if you like, uh, begins with a technical team, this technical team, together with a product owner, will tend to focus on the technical aspects of what it means to be agile. And that's a combination of best engineering practices um, that are designed to accelerate the feedback cycle, together with new ways of working with a new process that essentially um, helps the team collaborate with their customer and deliver value iteratively. So when you've reached um, a level of maturity, such as this one on, on the page, then you can assign yourself a goal. Okay, so the technical agility team has just scored a goal because they have achieved an incredibly mature level of technical agility. 
So, so far, the score is technical agility one, business agility nil. Yeah. Now, the product owner is obviously uh, paying attention and he's probably thinking, okay, I, I understand that we are now very mature in our adoption of technical agility and technical practices, but where is the customer? This happens because typically in, a, in a, an organization like this, you don't immediately get access to your customer. So here you can see um, um, on this slide, we, we have the customer on one side and then on the other side, we have a product owner and a team. And in between, you have a number of other actors. For example, you could have um, a project manager who um, thinks, you know, his or her job is to actually check that the team are doing their homework. Or you could have an architect who is sit sitting between the team and the customer and thinks, um, you know, whatever good idea you, you guys come up with, you should ask for my permission because I am the architect here. So I'm here to decide how we're going to work, which practices we are allowed to adopt and which we don't. Um, you, you may have delivery managers who sit between the customer and the team um, thinking, I am responsible for the, deliver the delivery. So when you guys have a product increment that's ready to go to a customer, you should go buy a me, of course. Or you could have stakeholders who are particularly um, eager to please the customer and they'll be sitting between the team and the customer and think, you know, when a customer wants a new feature, they will um, ask me for it and I will probably say yes before I even consult you guys and, and you tell me what's possible and how long it will take. And I'm, I'm not sure this is very typical. Um, it's a very typical scenario that many of us have experienced in trying to implement Agile in, in a number of organizations, right? So the way I'd like to put it is between a customer and a team working with a product owner, an Agile team, the only thing that you should have is a continuous learning cycle. You've probably seen this before, the build, measure, learn cycle, which essentially says you work with your customer, start, start with, a, with a hypothesis of what value means to your customer, start building a slice of functionality that will allow you to test your hypotheses, um, um, agree with your customer on how you're going to measure success, Okay, how do you know that your customer actually um, realizes the value with the feature that you've just implemented? And then use that learning cycle to uh, decide what you're gonna do next, okay? So Agile is really all about customer value. And you if you have a mature team who is mature in their ways of working and in their practices as well, and they can support a fast feedback cycle, then really your product owner and team should be working directly with the customer. This is one of the Agile principles after all. Um, customer collaboration is indeed on the Agile manifesto. So one of the ways in which um, you can facilitate such a transition is by positioning the role of the product owner well in your organization. And this is a topic that's very close to my heart and I often talk about this. I, I honestly think that um, around the industry, we have probably got the role of the product owner wrong in many, many cases. We are often still using product owners to deliver projects or to write user stories, you know, to, to populate the backlog or to build what the product owner himself or stakeholders think the product should be rather than building a product that delivers value to your customer. And we often think of product owners as a proxy for project management rather than product management. So we ask product owners to actually work on and produce long-term plans. So what I came up with on this slide is a, um, a, a manifesto, if you like, for what the real agile product owner should be. And I came up with, uh, with this acronym wrapper, which is completely made up of course. So the product owner should prioritize delivering customer value over delivering projects. And the product owner should really run the idea factory rather than running the user story factory. It's about ideas and outcomes for your customer rather than populating the backlog with work to keep your teams busy. Again, the product owner should really be there to help you build the right product for the customer rather than building 
what we think is the right product for the customer. Okay, so the product owner is really there to use data to make decisions. And if the data is not available, then we should obviously work together with the product owner to make that data available. Because it's much better to make decisions based on data and feedback from real customers than actually dwelling on, on, on um, um, assumptions. So ultimately, the product owner role is there to help an organization, especially an agile organization, learn continuously one iteration at a time, rather than producing long-term plans, okay? Right, so we've come to the uh, end of the first half of our uh, fictional football game. And for now, the uh, technical agility team is leading one nil against business agility. So in part two, what I, what I wanted to do is to give you a few recipes for achieving better business agility, building on top of what we have so far described as uh, technical agility milestones, okay? Okay, so it, we're talking about business agility now, and one of the first things that we can do, and I've actually tried this in practice um, in a couple of companies that I've worked on, um, is to implement what I call customer-centric value streams. So a, a customer-centric value stream is essentially an extended product development team, still agile, still cross-functional, which not only includes your product owner and development team, but it includes literally everyone that you need in your organization to satisfy a certain customer. It could be a customer or a customer segment. I'll give you an example. So if you are LandInvest, the company where I'm working on now, and you are working with brokers, so your customer on the right hand side here will be a broker and you can now build a cross-functional extended product development team which is made of everyone in lending best that you need to analyze and satisfy and deliver customer needs for brokers okay or if, if you are king so if you're making um, smartphone gains for example your customer or customer segment could be um, a customer aged 18 20 to 24 playing candy crush on his android smartphone okay so literally a customer centric value stream is like a cross-functional mini organization within a larger organization which is entirely focused on satisfying the needs of a particular customer or customer segment so you can think of these value streams as autonomous units which of course are delivering value to customers and are effectively focusing on delivering value for a particular customer or customer segment. Now, this recipe may seem easy to implement, but it's harder than it looks like on paper. And I'll, I'll tell you more about it to explain, to really explain why. So what we're talking about is essentially um, an organization where you start with different teams, with different reporting lines. And perhaps you, know, you have development teams reporting to um, their technical functional managers, and you have business teams reporting to their managers on their side. Now, what you're asking a value stream to do is essentially to act as an extended product development team without radically changing the organization, without changing the org chart and the reporting lines. So you're asking people who traditionally were not working together to now work together and adopt the same practices, agile practices, to deliver value for a particular customer or customer segment. So as a coach, the, the first challenge you will have to overcome and help this team overcome is how do we find a common language and also a common set of behaviors that will help us describe work and organize work and prioritize work and deliver work so that we can actually collaborate effectively even if we have not worked together before right so it's a real challenge and it's all about people but of course we know that often to make collaboration um, possible as a coach you'll have to focus on um, language and behavior and in order to facilitate the shift towards the right behavior and, and the right collaboration, um, it's not enough just to 
um, you know, ask these people to trust each other and work together, but you actually have to develop some common skills. Now, we all know in the Agile space that um, there are standard ways in which we can describe the work that needs to be done and in which we can prioritize and break down the work that needs to be done. And so um, here I'm showing you a few examples of real workshops and exercises that I was doing at Land Invest last year, where I was trying to involve people with different teams, for example, marketing, legal, um, you know, the finance teams, the operations teams, and, and make them work together to visualize the work in a similar way. And so one of the techniques that we uh, learned about was impact mapping. For those of you who are familiar with impact mapping, it's a very well known um, technique. Um, it's very well established in the agile space. And it's really there to visualize um, um, how to connect essentially your deliverables with the business goals and define the impact that your deliverables are going to have or you estimate that they're going to have on your customer and also agree on how you're going to measure that value for your customer. So here you can see some real pictures from mapping exercises um, as well as impact mapping we tried empathy mapping to, to better understand the need of our customers. So these techniques are really there to help facilitate the right conversations and to, um, to start having productive meetings that will hopefully, hopefully help these teams work together in case they have not worked together before. Now, there's another thing that happens when you start doing this kind of activities with these teams, um, is that uh, cross-pollination of practices. For example, when the legal team or the human resources team or the marketing team um, uh, see that the development team have been using Kanban and Kanban boards to visualize uh, who's doing what and visualize what's in progress, they might find that beneficial for their work too. So here on this slide, you can see examples again from Land Invest from last year, where you can see an, a few Kanban boards that uh, the, the marketing team and the legal team created for themselves. And these are really good ones, right? If you can see them, they have, they have uh, you know, the, the, the right breakdown of workflow steps, they have whip limits. So um, I was doing workshops um, at Land Invest with, with non-technical teams, and they would you know, grasp the, the basic notions of Kanban really, really quickly. They will then design their own workflow and they will start using Kanban to organize their own work, which, which was really cool. Um, and the HR team as well, they found it really beneficial to use Kanban to visualize their work too. Because if you think about it, if you're, if you're in human resources or, or even talent acquisition, you could use value proposition design principles. For example, you could model your customer as um, a potential uh, new employee of the company, someone who is highly skilled and that you're trying to recruit. So your, your value proposition design is essentially a better hiring process that you can use to hopefully attract the right kind of talent. And at the same time, you also have your own colleagues, uh, you know, the existing employees of the company to take care of. And so again, your backlog is split between work that you have to do for your colleagues right now and also work that you have to do to, um, to hire uh, the right uh, kind of talent for your company. So you could use agile techniques to prioritize your backlog and you can also use a Kanban board to, uh, to facilitate your daily stand-ups, for example. Okay, so customer-centric value streams is a first business agility recipe that I wanted to share with you tonight, straight from my um, real-life experience. And I would say that as a, as, a, as a coach or even as a company, when you have identified this solution and you've actually made it work for you, you have got enough going on that you could um, um, assign yourself a goal. Okay, so I think we should, we should assign the business agility uh, team a goal right now um, if they have successfully managed to identify the opportunity to build customer centric value streams across the organization. Um, the advantages of this approach are clear. You don't have to change your chart. You can essentially treat the value stream as a network. As long as people from different parts of the business come together and they use these techniques, for example, impact mapping or Kanban to facilitate the, the, the day-to-day -day, um, activities, okay? So this can be an effective 
um, an effective way to start implementing business agility. But as a coach, you really need to support these teams in, in kicking off um, you know, the, the right, the right uh, practices so they can, they can collaborate effectively. Right, a second recipe for business agility that I wanted to share with you tonight is autonomous product units. And uh, this experience for me comes, um, it goes all the way back to the TomTom -tom years. So I worked for TomToms for, for, for two, three years. And you may all know this company because they make GPS navigation systems for, for cars. But when I was there, we were actually working on a different product range, uh, the TomTom -tom sports watches. So these were activity of, uh, uh, fitness trackers, essentially. Um, a watch that you can wear and take with you when you go out for um, you know, a, a run or, or even when you go um, uh, biking or you go swimming and so on and so forth. So what TomTom Tom did was something really interesting. Um, they set up sports as a completely new autonomous product unit. And the advantages of this structure is that essentially you are building a company within the company. It's like a startup within the company. You have the benefit of um, the, 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 the bigger company around you actually giving you the, the initial funds that you need to, uh, to um, you know, start developing the new products and, and even higher if you need to do that and, and grow the team. But at the same time, you are small enough that you can move fast and you can ex experiment free of previous assumptions and free of previous experiences and biases. So here on this slide, you can see a typical structure like the one that we were using at TomTom. Tom. We were all aligned to a product manager and the product manager was there to represent the needs of our target customer. And the target customers could be runners, cyclists, swimmers, golfers, hikers, and so on and so forth. And of course, we still had our you know, functional managers in place like an engineering manager or um, a head of sports, a head of department who was holding the budget formally. Now, working with this product manager, you again had cross-functional teams made by um, technical uh, people, but also a variety of um, other profiles. For example, um, production engineers, head of marketing, head of sales. Uh, we had our own human resources. We had our own customer support. Um, so effectively, we were behaving like a mini company within TomTom. Now, this structure is very effective because um, it's a healthy silo, right? It's a, it's a, a self-contained business within a larger business. But the question remains when it comes to business agility, and, and that is, how do, we, how do we effectively facilitate collaboration across all the different teams, even inside a product, an autonomous product unit? Because these product units can actually be quite large. Then coll collaboration across teams is not um, to be taken for granted. It needs to somehow be facilitated. First of all, is it a good idea to expect that everyone will be collaborating across these teams? For example, on this side, you can see um, a software engineer and uh, someone from customer support. Um, should they actually be talking to each other? Is that beneficial to the business? Well, the answer is yes. And now we'll see how to facilitate something like this. What I'm about to share is a a really effective recipe for business agility. And it's all about um, um, setting goals and measures. Um, this is a very easy solution. And once you have identified it, it will seem pretty obvious to you. However, it's also a solution that often gets um, overlooked uh, by senior managers. Uh, this is what worked for us. So I want to share it with you tonight so that hopefully you can consider implementing it in your organizations as well. So typically, when we talk about goals and setting objectives for our workforce, we are often inclined to set objectives that relate to what work needs to be done or how the work will be delivered. Let me show you a few examples. So at TomTom, we were making uh, sports watches. These are sports devices. And to do this, we needed a variety of job profiles like software engineers, mechanical engineers, hardware engineers, um, electronics engineers, and so on and so forth. Now, there's a, um, on the top left hand side of this slide, um, you can see um, a web developer who says, for the integration with third party activity trackers, I'm going to use microservices. So he's describing 
how the work will be implemented. His bit, his side of the work. And now we can see a mechanical engineer who says, the watch that I'm making needs to be no more than 11 millimeters wide. And now we can see someone from marketing who says, my marketing campaign needs to be ready by June the 11th. So her goal is now set around the what needs to be done and by when. And last but not least, you can see a software engineer who says, I need to write um, an application framework in C++ running on 128 kilobytes RAM. This is true, by the way. This device that we were working on was very, very small, limited in capabilities, and it was very power efficient. So we had to actually write a C++ slash C software stack on a device that only had 128 kilobytes of RAM. So again, the software engineer is now talking about how the work is going to be done. There's a different way to do this. And this is something that our leaders at TomTom Tom really got right since the very beginning. And that is to connect your goals to the why. So our leaders came to us and they said, our reason to be is to essentially launch a new range of products onto the market, which will be very well received by our customer. Okay, and the measure for that is going to be four stars on Amazon. Now it's easy, isn't it? Because it doesn't matter if you work in marketing, if you're a software engineer, if you're a web developer, if you're a mechanical engineer. You all know that your primary goal, your first target, is to make a product that will be very well received by your customer. It's to try and, and come up with the best user experience and use your skills to, to make that happen in collaboration with others. And you all have the same goal, four stars on Amazon. Now it's easy, right? Because when you launch a new product um, onto, onto the market, the first few months are always a bit chaotic. And you know, there may be features that your customers will want that you haven't necessarily implemented in your product. Um, or there will be um, things that your customers don't, don't feel comfortable with in terms of new features they have to learn or um, unfortunately sometimes bugs that they might have found in your product. And now for a software engineer, it's much easier to collaborate with someone from customer support because we both have the same goals. So it's very easy for me as a software engineer to, uh, to um, uh, you know, find reasons to collaborate with customer support because customer support is the bridge between me and my goal of four stars on Amazon and the, the, the real customer base out there. So again, this is a very easy recipe, but um, it gets often overlooked. Always connect your goals to the why, not the what, not the how. This is a really broad topic and we won't be able to really you know, exhaust it tonight, but if you're interested, um, I'm going to suggest a really good book by Fred Kaufman, which is called uh, Conscious Business, How to Build Value Through Values. And another one, which is a classic by Simon Sinek, um, which you have probably already heard of, which is Start With Why. Again, it's a classic. So in case you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Now, our adventure at TomTom was a really good one. It was a really, really exciting journey. Um, imagine that uh, none of us in the team had ever worked on a sports product before. But our leaders did a really good job of really clarifying the, the vision, what good looks like, um, why we exist as a product unit, um, how to best satisfy the customer. And our first product was actually mentioned on the GQ magazine, which is a lifestyle magazine here in the UK, as one of the uh, 100 coolest products in the world at that moment in time, in 2014. Um, you know, you've probably seen this product yourself. Um, back in the days, um, you, you know, you had products like the Garmin, for example, that was very popular, the, the Polar, the Sunto. These were very um, uh, highly accurate, very popular products uh, that, um, uh, you know, someone who is a professional runner uh, would have bought. To, um, to assist him with activity tracking. But one thing we did at TomTom Tom was to really understand um, our customer base, both males and females, and try to understand what was um, 
potentially the gap that there was at the time in the market. And we were trying to essentially address this gap by um, coming up with a better value proposition design. And two of the key aspects we considered um, was, for example, the, the width of the device. We discovered that not many women, um, funnily enough, will buy a device like this because it's too thick, so it's not very nice to wear on your wrist. So what we did to work around this problem was to move the GPS antenna to the button control. So you can see on this slide, there is a button control that um, uh, you know, is a square one, um, north, south, east and west. And um, we, we actually placed the GPS antenna behind it to uh, take the antenna out of the module and, uh, and come up with a very, very thin module, only 11 millimeters wide. So we did a very good job of not trying to implement all the possible features that our competitors already had in the market at that time, because if we did that, then we would just be playing catch up. And that's not the right thing to do. When you come up with a new product, you have to understand uh, what your customer really wants. Your customers don't always tell you what they want, so you have to really um, you know, uh, test the ground uh, through some other means. Um, and the most effective way to do this is to actually come up with the first iteration of your product and then use that iteration to start getting customer feedback uh, for you to understand what to do next. Uh, you might have heard of the build trap. So this is essentially something that um, uh, many agile teams still do despite uh, calling themselves agile. And it's the, um, uh, the temptation to um, in, you know, inflate the scope, inflate the product backlog with all sorts of features, trying to chase perfection before they actually hit the market. Um, it's strongly recommended that you don't do this. And there's a book uh, by Melissa Perry that I'd like to suggest, which is called Escaping the Build Trap. And it's centered around this concept. Only build stuff that you know your customer will want to use. And in order to do this, you have to start with a very thin version of what your final product or the end product looks like and start delivering that to the market, starting with the high value, high risk features, and then see how the market receives your product. And this is exactly what we did at TomTom. We um, developed five iterations of this product, which TomTom released in more or less five years. And the first, the first product was very simple, uh, both hardware and software. And then uh, we started to release more features on top of that initial product. And there's another book that I'd like to suggest, um, which is uh, Value Proposition Design. It's a really, really good book. It's definitely changed my life. So a highly recommended book, which uh, gives you concrete recipes to actually um, implement um, your value proposition design. Okay, when you've got to, to this level of business agility, it's time to assign yourself a second goal. So if you can organize um, product units that operate in an autonomous manner within a large organization, and you can actually go to market with, um, with those product units, uh, then you've really achieved business agility in my eyes. So this is when I am assigning a, a goal to the business agility team, which is now um, leading two to one. Right, moving on to the next and last recipe I'd like to share with you tonight. And um, you've probably heard of A-B testing. And um, I actually thought I knew how A-B testing worked until I worked at King. So um, I read about A-B testing, then as an engineer, I implemented it uh, you know, you know, some very simply in a, couple of, in a couple of commercial scenarios. But then I worked at King, which is obviously a, a gaming company. Um, they are the ones who make Candy Crush and other games. And they are the ones who have successfully managed to make you play Candy Crush for years. How do they do that? they have implemented what, in my eyes, it's probably the most advanced version of A-B testing I've, I've ever seen. Um, and whatever I'm about to tell you is not secret, by the way. You can learn more about these things from uh, articles and blog posts that um, King have published online. So the context around A-B testing is wh whenever you, know, you come up with a new idea and you don't know if your customer is going to log it or not, then what you can do is you can start with a uh, initial hypotheses, and then around that initial assumption, you can define testable alternatives. 
So you have an idea for a new feature, and then you ask yourself, um, how do I build it? And how much of it should I build? Um, and most importantly, how do I then learn fast from customer feedback? Once you have your testable alternatives, you can produce um, a testable iteration, if you like, in, in the form of a prototype. You can mock it, you don't necessarily have to build it, or you can even do in-product A-B testing. Uh, to give you an example, if I am releasing a game and I have a, an idea for a new feature, then what I can do is to um, try this new feature in the, in, the, um, in the game itself, or I can even try and use the new feature in a different game to try and take out the risk of the new feature potentially not being well uh, received by my customer when they play um, you know, my mainstream game, my most consolidated game, if you like. So if you have a number of products, you can even cross pollinate uh, these products and, and these A-B tests across products. You don't necessarily have to do everything inside one product only, okay? So using A-B testing effectively, companies like King, for example, even go as far as using artificial intelligence to, um, uh, to try and simulate all the possible scenarios, all the possible interactions that your customers will have with your product or, or feature when this has reached the market. And again, at King, I have seen what I think is probably one of the most complicated um, data pipelines um, in Europe, maybe in the world, and, and they have a really advanced way of doing A-B testing. And to do that, they literally have to process billions of data points every single day. They have, uh, they have uh, a large market of millions of active players every day, so it is not surprisingly that they, they have to do that if they want to implement A-B testing effectively. So A-B testing is another recipe I'd like to share with you, and I think it really powers business agility. It does it by giving you um, a technical agility recipe, if I can call it that. Um, we, we all know that uh, in order to implement A-B testing effectively, we need the ability to only release a feature for a number of customers based on some criteria, for example, um, uh, infrastructure or environment or geographical location and so on and so forth. And there's a book I'd like to um, um, share with you, which is Testing Business, Business Ideas, again by Osterwalder, the same author as uh, Value Proposition Design. So one of the things you can do if you're, if you're after business agility is to implement A-B testing. The added benefit of A-B testing is that it takes a lot of the pressure away from the teams to have to come up with the right decision. You don't have to come up with the right decision. You have to have the ability to test potentially any idea or any prototype and test it with real customers in a real uh, production-like environment, which is much more powerful than assumptions. With data in your hands, you can make much better decisions, right? But to do this, you need um, the right technical capabilities. So, um, even though this is a business agility recipe, I'm actually going to assign a goal to the technical agility team, just to continue with our football metaphor, because as I said, I think you need the right level of um, technical capability, understanding as well by the technical team on why A-B testing is useful and how to implement it in practice. But once you have it, it will be really, really easy to, for you to sell it to your business because the benefits of A-B testing are, are so obvious. It's probably one of the best, most effective ways to get real feedback from your customers. Okay, so we've come to the end of these uh, uh, fictional 90 minutes. So our football game is almost over. Technical agility and business agility are drawing. Uh, so we'll need some extra time to decide who's going to win this game. Okay, and in extra time, we are quickly going to look at some of the people aspects and some of the cultural aspects that in my experience as a coach are really essential for you to implement business agility at all levels in the organization. Um, I'm sure you have probably seen um, what is now known as the Agile Onion. Um, this, this visual representation of the different levels of maturity 
um, of your adoption of, of, of Agile from tools and processes to uh, all the way to mindset, essentially. Um, and the, uh, this, this visual has been made popular by Adventures with Agile, AWA, AWA which is a, a company, a consultancy that um, is very active here in the UK, especially. Um, but I'm sure they are probably operating worldwide as well. So this, this representation here on the screen essentially says that the tools and the processes and also the practices that we call Agile these days, they are highly visible, but they are probably less powerful in really helping you realize the full benefits of an Agile transformation. On the other hand, if you really want to get the full benefits of an Agile transformation, then you should focus on more the principles, the values and the mindset. Um, these are more intangible aspects, but also more powerful at the same time. Um, as a coach, and I'm sure you will relate with this uh, challenge that I'm about to introduce, uh, you will often find that um, the, the adoption of an Agile mindset is often confined to uh, product development teams on the ground. Um, so the leadership team doesn't necessarily participate to the Agile transformation for a number of reasons. And so as a coach, one of the first things you, want, you probably want to do is to find ways to make them join that dialogue and to make them understand what uh, the Agile transformation means for them in case they are not driving it directly. But they should be really. That's the, the best way, the most effective way to really make progress in your organization with Agile. In particular, I think the leadership team should really participate and provide a sense of purpose so that everyone is clear on why we're doing what we're doing, as well as a sense of focus. Um, there's, a, there's a really nice definition of focus by um, Eliahu Goldratt, author of uh, a very popular book called uh, The Goal. And uh, Eli Goldratt says, focus is the ability to do what should be done and also not do what should not be done. Um, but how to do this in practice is definitely a challenge, isn't it, for, for many businesses? How to find your focus and communicate it effectively. As a leadership team, you have to um, grant effective autonomy to your workforce. You're not there to manage the day-to-day -day work, the day-to-day -day activity, but you're there to really create an environment where everybody is effective in working autonomously and also can um, run experiments safely in a way that is going to help uh, your value proposition design efforts. Essentially the leadership team, especially in an agile organization, but this is true for any organization, should really be there to facilitate continuous improvement at all levels really. And to do this, you, um, starting with the leadership team, you have to really embrace the benefits of um, accelerated learning. Now, in a, in a truly organization, in a truly agile organization, sorry, um, it's undeniable that in order to implement some of these aspects, you, you will have to work um, on the culture. And often the best way to affect culture, especially in a large organization, is to really change the structure of the organization, as we know. Now, for the leadership team to do this effectively, they will uh, most certainly have to work um, shoulder to shoulder with, uh, with the human resources team. So the HR becomes key in your agile transformation, if you like. Uh, they are a key vehicle for organizational design. They can help you um, harmonize objectives and metrics in a way that is, um, you know, uh, that works in favor of your agile transformation, but also uh, bring the existing policies to the table so that the disruption is managed um, and, it, and it can be, um, you know, transitioned over time. Um, the focus for HR is definitely to develop people, to help you be, well, this is obviously a focus for everybody, especially the leadership team, but with the help of HR, you can, you can structure the uh, development roadmap, if you like, in a way that is going to um, work well for your people. So HR should work with leadership teams to um, facilitate employee engagement, to make it possible in the workplace. 
and again to work on the culture and the structure of organization so that agility isn't too disruptive and it's hopefully easier to implement. And last but not least, um, every organization has an org chart, but as an agile coach, I often find uh, working with agile teams um, requires a lot of systemic thinking. Um, and one of the first things that we do is to actually, you know, ask these teams not to let the artificial barriers of the org chart dictate what they are allowed to do and, and what they are not allowed to do. They should feel, um, you know, they, they're definitely um, allowed to collaborate with anybody in the organization, uh, regardless of the org chart, if that makes sense from a customer value point of view. Regardless of your role in the organization, if you're working together as part of a, an autonomous product unit, as part of a customer-centric value stream, then you should reach out and build networks across the organization, across the, the managerial boundaries of it. And there's uh, three last books that I would like to suggest as we come to the end of this talk. And one is by Simon Sinek, Leaders It Last, a really good one. And there's also a classic by Frederick Lalou, which is called Reinventing Organizations. And last but not least, uh, David Marquet, um, Turn the Sheep Around. So David Marquet especially focuses on um, autonomy, purpose, and mastery. And I'm sure you've probably heard of this um, already. And I particularly like the definition of autonomy that David Marquet gives us because uh, I find it really pragmatic. Um, he says autonomy means pushing authority to information. So it's a really powerful definition. If you want people to be autonomous, um, you will have to essentially give the power to make decisions to the people that have the information to make those kind of decisions. And that's not always the case, especially for um, hierarchical organizations, because it's often the, the, the managers and the, the senior managers even, um, who are often uh, the people with the least amount of information making the day-to-day -day decisions on, uh, on uh, you know, project or product development. Okay, so if you can effectively implement the Agile Onion in your organization, which again requires tight collaboration with the leadership team and uh, human resources and with everybody really across the organization, then you've definitely scored a third goal uh, for business agility this time. Because uh, in my experience as a coach, I think business agility really um, um, you know, needs to be implemented via organizational design tools and solutions. And that often means people and the way we collaborate and the way we structure ourselves and in general, the culture of the organization at all levels. Okay. So at the end of this game, very exciting one, Business Agility 3, Technical Agility 2. And I'm gonna give you a quick summary of what we covered before I open up the floor for questions. So in summary, um, the, the kind of key messages I'd like to leave with you tonight are that agility is really a vehicle to innovation and experimentation. Agile organizations should be structured to maximize continuous learning. It's not just about implementing Scrum or Kanban with your technical teams. Technical agility is definitely a key enabler, but business agility is the real goal, okay? You do agile because you wanna satisfy your customers and in return, you want to achieve your business goals. You want to win on the market. Experimentation needs an, an agile organization, an agile mindset. So as much as you can, promote a flat hierarchy and also networks within the organization. Agile leaders are really there to provide a clear purpose and also enable autonomy at all levels. Um, product owners, this is a key role that uh, you need to position rightly in the organization, uh, correctly in the organization. And uh, these product owners really need to be empowered to drive the right outcomes and also maximize value. And last not least, uh, foster collaboration with unified goals and success metrics, as we saw earlier in uh, when I shared my TomTom -tom experience. Excellent, so I'll stop sharing my screen now. And once again, I wanna thank you very much for your time and patience. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing this.
really full of insight. Also, a specific thank you, as I wrote in the chat, for uh, all the references for our Agile libraries. <laughs> you, you mentioned a lot of books that we will add in our list. So thank you very much also for this, uh, let me say, very practical tip. Um, any question from the audience? Please open your microphone and maybe also your camera and ask a question to Salvatore. I have a question. Here. Yep, Lola. Um, but if we could go back to the presentation, mm -hmm. um, there's just one slide on the product owner. It was right at the end of the first half. Mm -hmm. The the really agile product owner slide. Yeah, exactly that one. The manifesto one. It should be on the screen in a second. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. So the last one you said that the product owner should be learning continuously over producing long term plans. Mm -hmm. And my question is, um, do you have any recommendations or tips on what to do to enable that learning for the product owner, knowing that they might have a pressure from the business to provide a long-term plan? <laughs> for sure. And that's, this is a very, very good question, by the way. Thank you for this. I do have a couple of ideas, yes. Um, my recommendations to the product owners and the teams I work with uh, is this. When it comes to roadmaps, it's um, absolutely understandable that we need to have a roadmap. But instead of it being a roadmap of projects, features, or deliverables, can we make it a roadmap of impacts? Mm -hmm. so when, when we connect impacts to goals, for example, using impact mapping, we are essentially deciding how we're going to impact, how we're going to change customer behavior, or what we're going to do to change customer behavior in a way that will help us achieve our goals. To do this, it's a fairly abstract process. So to do this, you don't necessarily have to lock yourself into a particular solution. You can change your deliverables as you discover more for the market. But you don't have to link the impact to a deliverable. So make your roadmap a roadmap of business impacts. Tell the business what you're going to focus on at any particular period of time depending on your business goals, instead of actually mentioning what project or what feature you're going to deliver in particular. Does it, does it address your question? Is this, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It, it, it makes a lot of sense, um, but I see the challenge coming in of the um, asking people the question, okay, so what impact should we make? <laughs> right. You know, like um, just as you said, that idea of visualizing this um, might be a bit, might be slightly challenging, um, but yeah, I, I do like your answer. Thank you. I, I can give you a very quick example if you like. So let's say you're making a, um, a game for smartphones, and let's say that one of your business goals is to make more revenue from ads. Mm -hmm. How can you do this? What impact should you try and implement to change your customer behavior? One quick way to do this could be to find a way to make your, your customers spend more time playing the games or have your customers spend more time in the app by having the ability to chat with other players. Yeah. So these features that you'll be implementing are there in your backlogs. You'll be trying them out. But if you realize from the market that they don't actually work, you can now change direction and think of something else without changing the impact. The impact is still that you would like to have your customer to spend more time in your app because ultimately you want to make more revenue from ads. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you. Very welcome. Any more questions? Well, actually, I have a question related to Ulaus one. And in, in the recent weeks, we have some speakers talking about the difference between output and outcomes that is very similar to what you are describing, differentiating features and impact. Mm -hmm. Is this the same or um, there are some differences? It's definitely the same. Um, one thing that I recommend to my team, so when they ask me what, what kind of metrics 
would give us a good indication of how agile we are today. And I, I, I mentioned one, which is lead time to business impact. Measure the time between you coming up with an idea for a feature or the customer asking for a feature and the time when you can actually measure the impact that your feature has had on your customer. It's about outcomes. It's not enough to just do it. It's not about outputs. It's not enough to release it. You also have to know, you have to be able to measure the impact that your customer feature has had on the market. So it's definitely the same thing. It's the same language. It's that shift from outputs towards outcomes. Does it make sense, Karab? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, there is a question in, in the chat. Um, at the end, uh, maybe offline, send me the link for, uh, for the deck so we can share with uh, the participants to download the deck. Um, I will actually, do. I have a question. I have one more question, but I don't want to monopolize the, the session. So if someone else has uh, another question, please don't be shy. Don't be shy. Okay, okay, I go in the meantime, just to break the ice. And um, in, in your presentation, you actually didn't mention, you didn't talk about scaling. Okay, yeah. I mean, you never use the word scaling. There are some references, but never using the word scaling. So yeah. the question is how scaling could change the game? Mm -hmm. the, it's a very good question. Thanks, Karada. It gives me the opportunity to clarify something. So um, I don't talk of, scaling as in scaling frameworks or methodologies that will help us scale because I often find that these are done um, in an agnostic way, in a way that doesn't take your customer into account or in a way that doesn't help you structure yourself um, to deliver that value to your customers. Scaling frameworks seem to be, in my eyes, the quickest solution to start taking you away from your traditional, perhaps, waterfall structure towards true agility. So something like SAFE, for example, for me, is a first step away from your current structure to help you start using the, you know, the right terminology, the right practices. But you're not, when you're scaling, you're not at a true level of agility. The best level of agility you can think of is when you don't need to scale because you have optimized your structure, your processes and your teams so that you can do everything you need to do, deliver value to your customers with small autonomous units. So you don't need to worry too much about dependencies on other functions in the business. You don't need to worry too much about um, the traditional P3M structure, you know, programs, projects and, and so on and so forth. Does it make sense, Carole? Yeah, let uh, me say I partially agree with you because mm -hmm. you don't need absolutely to scale if you don't need scaling. But it's also true that there are particular scenarios where scaling is not an alternative, is, uh, is mandatory. So true. when you have more teams working together on the same product, for example, if you have a value stream as you described, okay? So they are working on the same product. Then they can work as a different component team. They can work as a feature teams. So managing part of the journey, what else? You know the reality because we share this reality. Um, actually, there are some dynamics uh, when you are scaling that I, I think are changing the game. It's like to play, let me say, different games in different fields in the same moment with the same player, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, if I have to continue with the metaphor, okay. Um, so just the question was, uh, how can uh, we, we face this kind of situation? Because this is a reality, actually. I'm not talking about the frameworks. I'm talking about the situation where you have maybe 100 people working on the same product. Yeah. So you um, cannot have one single thing. Absolutely. Um, my, my preference will be to organize the work first so break down the work first and then organize the people around the work mm -hmm. okay and so in, in this respect um, if i had to compare for example the two like most traditional uh, scaling frameworks um, that you probably know of around the industry which seem to be safe and less 
at this point in time. I would say that my model for scaling is probably closer to less large scale Scrum. If you absolutely have to scale and you have dependencies across teams, make these stable long-term feature teams, cross-functional feature teams aligned to outcomes, aligned to customers as much as possible. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me say in theory is correct. <laughs> Try and break all the dependencies as much as you can. Only manage those dependencies that you haven't managed to break. But try and break them to begin with. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. sure. This is absolutely the same concept for, for other. When we had uh, Luca here talking about scaling framework, that is, uh, this is exactly the tips coming from him that is, okay, remove dependency. Right. Okay. That makes sense. But you know, sometimes this is not really possible. I'm not saying that it's not feasible, but it's not really possible. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to deal with this situation. But however, again, I, I was curious to know what was your uh, your idea in the in the game uh, for for this kind of situation. Perfect. Any more questions? Any more questions? Okay. We have five minutes. Any other observation on the presentation? Okay, let me let me share my opinion. I really love this presentation because I mean you were able to to split, let me say, the chapters of your presentation with the metaphor of the goals. Um, and I really love it. Uh, not, not sure if the real result should be on uh, business agility probably it will be how can i say i will move uh, in uh, in the penalty section not in the extra time but in the <laughs> the penalty session uh but uh, however it's true that you you cannot consider yourself agile only because you are doing test automation or mm. or, or as I know, because you are using Jira, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. And yeah, unfortunately, we do do come across um, cases yeah, like yeah. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thanks okay. for the suggestion, actually. It could be, um, the, the penalties could be a good uh, way to spin it in, in my next yeah, yeah, because I mean, they, they arrived just at the end and no one really beat the others, right. the other team, and they have to work together. Right, right. I don't Another another metaphor could be also using the barbarians team. You know the rugby barbarians team. It's the team made by great players from different teams. Doesn't matter the nation and the uh -huh. all stars you are played with. Yeah, it's like the all star game. Yeah, right. But however, I really love it, and it's Thank not you. my first time in this, but I love it. Thank you so much, Carlo. And yeah, for everyone uh, who joined us here tonight, I I hope that some of the experiences that I shared resonate with what you see in the workplace and i hope that uh, you know some of these recipes could actually help you take things forward yeah thank you very much yeah J just a last question okay that i have uh, i have for me but uh, what, what is uh, given that you work it in so many different companies okay can you share what is the biggest difference of implementing uh, let me say agile or a transformation or a practice across these companies that you worked on it's really actually this is a really good question because um when i when i look back at how we did it i can really see that um the um that the main traits of the adoption in this or that company were somehow linked to the organ to the culture of that organization. For example, back in TomTom, Tom, we were using a combination of Scrum and XP, but really it didn't matter because the, the whole mentality of the company was very much focused around products, products, customers. It was very much, uh, you know, being a consumer electronic um, uh, company means you're always um, competing with other companies in a very aggressive market where the margins are tight and you have to come up with really good ideas for the next product. So we had full autonomy as technical teams um, and it didn't really matter if we were doing scrum or kanban or xp or if we were using this tool or that tool it was really like transparent and to me that actually works really well because it means that as a technical team you don't have to lose sleep over your ways of working but you can um, you can make sure that you're aligned on the business goals and giving your stakeholders what they need from you 
Now, if I look at other um, environments, for example, the large banks like Lloyd's and NatWest that where I worked, there was a lot more structure, a lot more focus around the ways of working. There was budget for it. There was obviously a, a larger population of agilists um, that you can work with. Um, so agile was in itself an objective because the entire organization, which is a really large one, is trying to transition, is trying to transform the ways of working. So in TomTom, Tom, agile was not an objective, but in NatWest, for example, it definitely was, if that makes sense. So in some ways, the, um, the focus and the ways in which the agile transformation was carried out was a reflection of the culture of the organization at that moment in time. And where I am now at Lend Invest, for example, I'm really enjoying it. Our technical teams are very, very mature. You know, we, we do DevOps, continuous delivery. Um, we do Kanban. We, don't, we never talk of Scrum. Um, but again, the challenge for Lend Invest is how to really accelerate um, on the business side of things so that we can leverage the, the maturity that we have technically to, to win the market. Then they're already doing very well, but they, they, can, uh, they can take their agility to the next level. Um, and that's, that's a challenge I really enjoy. Thank you, really interesting, really interesting. Okay. Okay, so uh, keep in touch with, uh, with uh, Salvatore about the link uh, for, the, for the deck that uh, we will share in the next days. And thank you, Salvatore, for sharing this, really helpful. And uh, I will stop the recording before I forgot it. And thank you all for joining this.